Know this? Introducing the original Blood Clad Podcast, not PS. Told in semantic. Special dedication all the way from New York. Boom! Yeah, man, SWOT semantic. Yeah, man, oh. Boom! Soothing semantic. Yeah, man, oh. Big up, sir, man. Soothing semantic. On another episode of Soothing Semantics, I'm your host, Rafi Pinsky. Make sure to subscribe, smash the like button, leave your comments, and here we go. There Today, we go. Today, we have Alexander Goldstein, the king of Golden Beach. Self-proclaimed. The, absolutely. <clears throat> the uh, founder, broker, and owner of Miles Goldstein Real Estate. You, you named it after your golden retriever, if I'm not mistaken. Well, it's, a, <clears throat> it's an interesting order of the story. My middle name is Miles. So my middle name is Miles, Miles Goldstein. My dog, we named Miles Goldstein, but the company had uh, already existed. I started oh, the company okay. in 2016. We got my dog two to three years later, three years later. So yeah, oh, okay. so the dog I, came after the fact. I had a, I don't know what, I thought you named it after your dog and I was like, wow, that's, that's real commitment. It was a, a master plan. Gotcha. And my son's Maximus Miles Goldstein. We're very on brand. I hear you, okay. <laughs> so he's gonna be taking over the company. The dog or the kid. And we'll, <laughs> we'll see, one, we'll as see long who as battles that out. You know? As long as there's a Goldstein. As long as there's a Goldstein. Yes. So, uh, people watching, I have reached out. I reached out to Alex quite a long time ago. Uh, if any of you watched the Adam Sosnick episode, you heard that a similar thing happened. I reached out many times. And with Alex, Alex asked me if I would come to the office. And my ego got the best of me to a degree. And, you know, it wasn't a matter of right or wrong. I just, you know, sometimes you do what you got to do. And I think maybe after a very long time, maybe you would have come to me. But I think at the end of the day, uh, being here is incredible. You know, just seeing your office. I've followed you on Instagram since the start of my real estate career. I appreciate that. Uh, you're extremely well known in South Florida. I mean, saying that is an understatement. I mean, anyone who's anybody knows who you are. I appreciate that. And you, you I hope for great reasons. What what bad reasons could there be? We'll have to find Not out. Not that we'll I know. Some, we'll have to do some digging. <laughs> have to hire my PI. Uh, so I see just the videos you put out, the passion you have for real estate. Uh, you know, you you you're funny and serious at the same time. You have a very competitive mindset, which I very much relate to. You know, I, I like easygoing people, but I always appreciate somebody funny who's, and serious. I like that. Yeah, dude. I like someone who's always looking to get to the top of the industry. And for you, you're not looking to sell a few homes and call it a day. You mm -hmm. have a, a massive, massive, bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And I see that in all the videos you post. I see when you're, when you're driving in the Bentley and you're discussing the new house that you're selling or the homes in the neighborhood or the homes you have sold, there's a lot of passion and love for what you do. So to, to start, first off, thank you for, for joining me. Thank you for having me. Dude, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for honor. joining me in my office. Absolutely. Our office. Absolutely. So before we get into how you've sold homes as much as $30 million, maybe you've sold more. I know you had a listing for, what is it, 52? I haven't sold that expensive a home yet, but we've had okay. listings for that level. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. How did you, what was your upbringing like? I mean, you grew up in Golden Beach, right? I grew up in Golden Beach. Okay. Um, a different Golden Beach than Golden Beach is today. My parents came across Golden Beach when it was a very low-key, under-the-radar family neighborhood. It was a time when there was no Lehman Causeway in South Florida. For those familiar with the area, that is the main causeway to get over to the coast, to Collins. It didn't exist. What was there before? There was no bridge there. <clears throat> there was lots of forest. It all looked like forest land. And from And from Golden Beach, overlooking the waterways, instead of seeing all the buildings, which are there now, from Aven that, which is Aventura, it was all forest, all Greenland. So my parents found it when it was like no man's land. So w real quick, because I moved here less than four years ago, Aventura was pretty much created by one person, Don Sofer. Don Sofer, okay. correct. The, the building I live in, the Flamenco and North Country Club, it's about 40 years old. Mm -hmm. So Aventura itself wasn't built 40 years ago? Aventura was around, but it wasn't as built out as it was today. There weren't these towers. That was like a, a work in progress over the years. And Sofer was brilliant way ahead of his time. And he's a big reason that people started to shift their attention north. 
And that's still happening as we speak. That's pretty much what we're dealing with in these communities right now in these cities. You know, there is a massive trend and look towards the northern area, South Florida, of Miami, North Miami Beach. You know, Golden Beach borders Broward County. Mm -hmm. The end of Golden Beach is Hallandale. So from so far, really, those times was when that attention really took on to these areas. Then you had guys like Desert come in and he invested heavily onto the ocean right outside of Golden Beach and Sunny Isles. You know, these are all some of your more progressive mindsets of these areas. They saw things that were going to come here light years ahead. It's amazing. I moved to Aventura from New York. I'm sure you know I'm, I'm originally from Brooklyn. I so never left. where my family's from. Oh, re- oh you mm-hmm. really? I am the only one my year and forward that uh, is not from Brooklyn. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it must be why we get along so well. Oh, dude, all of my buddies, all my closest friends are from New York. It's in the blood. Yeah, dude, hundred <laughs> percent. So the, so I, I moved to Aventura immediately. I purposely didn't want to be in the party scene. I mm-hmm. didn't want to be in Brickle. I'm kind of sick and tired of the crazy traffic and the yep. yelling and this and that. Um, so Aventura sounded like a great option, and I love it. It's 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 central to Broward and Miami Dade. It's I mean it's in Miami Dade, but it's north as 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 you mentioned. And for me, I love the area. It's, it's great. The location's epic. It's amazing. It's epic. It's a nice mix of city, but neighborhoods, and there's parts of Aventura that you can veer off of and not feel like you're in this heated, busy city. And I lived in Aventura for the last nine years. I rented a unit there um, in a great building at a beautiful apartment. I loved it. I loved every second of it. Um, and I was there up until about a year and a half ago. I'm a huge fan of Aventura. Tremendous. And I've always been. It's a place that I think has an endless potential future you know especially value speaking i think it's a completely undervalued city overall you have a nice mix of living styles homes apartments it's sitting right in front of aventura mall which is arguably the number one shopping destination on earth it's 12 minutes from bell harbor arguably the other biggest shopping destination on earth um and again this is part of the reason of the growth of aventura sunny isles golden beach north miami generally speaking as a whole it's very special um, I got away from your question a little bit as far as my upbringing, Golden Beach. You know, my, my parents fell in love with it. They were living at the time in Hollywood. I was born in Hollywood, actually. And before I turned one, we moved into Golden Beach, my parents did. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> I had an incredible childhood. You know, it was a very relaxed, low-key. I spent 90% of my day outdoors playing sports in the parks, in the street, in puddles. You know, I was a very rugged, athletic-style kid. Still am. Um, I thank my parents a lot for my special childhood I got brought up with. Um, very close to my parents. My mom and dad are my best friends to this minute. You have siblings or no? I do not. I, was I am an only child. So, but, so am I, by the way. No shit. Okay. Well, not exactly. I have... Dude, it's a long story. We're not going to go into it now. <laughs> well, it's either got siblings or you don't. I'm kidding. I have half siblings. Okay, fine. I'll my you. mother had, a, had, an, had, a young, had another son after me with someone else, and my father had other kids. My gotcha. father's Italian. Okay. I never met him. It's a long so story. You got some extra buddies and friends in there. Right? But yeah. I grew up as an only child. I had dogs and cats and iguanas and turtles and birds, and I was a uh, a sibling of, of animals. <coughs> so we both you know? love animals, and too. And I still I think. think I'm a little bit of an animal, but, you know, I thank my parents for that. So it should be, baby. We'll get into that. So, so uh, okay, so Golden Beach, you grew up here. Your teenage, you played a lot of sports. What what brought you into real estate? So say late teens, early 20s, what were you up to? Did you go to college? Were you thinking of doing something else initially? Late teens, I was overcoming a health ordeal. So my early teens, I was a healthy kid, never been sick in my life, never had a cold. I had colds. Never anything significant. I barely even knew my doctor. Barely had a pediatrician. I was so healthy. Um, my early teens, out of nowhere, I started to feel sick. One day my stomach hurt. You know, the next day it went from hurting to my whole body felt weird. And flash forward within a month or two of that, you know, we, we went to go see a, a stomach specialist and the next thing you know, I was in the hospital. And flash forward that, I was there for months and that turned into two major stomach surgeries and a whole whirlwind of an event down the road of dealing with my health. Um, so my late teens was basically it was like a new life for me. You know, I had had everything stripped away from me when I was put into the hospital. And that was like my uh, awakening at 14 years old. So that was a tremendous thing for me going into my teens. Uh, you know, I was 13, 14 I years old. I remember you posting happened. something about this. Yeah. This is one of my uh, major 
life changes that happened to me that altered my entire future. No questions asked. So my mid to late teens was very much about being reborn in every sense of the words. Mm -hmm. My appreciation on life changed drastically. My outlook on life changed drastically. What I did, how I did it, what I cared about, everything changed. Um, it was one of the greatest things to ever happen to me in my life. You know, I, I joke with people, I was living in La La Land before that. You know, I thought the world was all hugs and kisses and rainbows and perfection. And I was, I was shown the other side of the world um, as far as struggles and dealing with stuff and life. And that was my entrance into the battle. So you think that you would say life was very easy for you prior to that health condition? I don't know if I'd use the word easy, but it was, everything was perfect. You know, I don't know if the word was easy, but it was, you know, your, your ideal situation for me as a kid. Played lots of sports. I was always outside. I was, I felt great, great family stuff, great friends. Everything was all good. And then really all of a sudden it was like a, a train came, you know, but sure. again, I, I look at it as one of the best things that ever happened to me. Give you tons of perspective and you realize what was important. I'm it gave me the perspective. <clears throat> and that perspective really has affected every single day of my life moving forward to this minute. Tremendously. And I still battle with health stuff. I'm still dealing with it. I'm still medicated. I'm still, let's put it, fighting the fight. But I'm winning. Okay. So <laughs> what are some things that you have to deal with on a daily basis? Discomfort. You know, it's, it's based out of my stomach, you know, my, my illness that I deal with. And I, I have Crohn's disease is what I deal with specifically. Um, I have a, I would call it like a hybrid quasi version of this because I was misdiagnosed at one point. I had surgeries based on that misdiagnosis. So what I ended up with was this hybrid scenario of this illness, which I'm thankful for. And I'm really thankful for all of it and how it went because again it took me down this road to where I am right now um, generally speaking just some discomfort stuff headaches muscle aches joint stuff irritability um, but you know all things that I think people generally deal with every single day of their lives even without an, an illness in place I think people generally have muscle aches and cramping and discomfort and irritability i mean i don't think i'm naming anything that you probably don't feel regularly too it happens dude. um it so I, I think it's stuff that people all deal with but yeah generally speaking that's some of the stuff i i run through on a daily okay okay so sometimes yeah, sometimes you have to run to the uh, to the loo to the john more than some other people sometimes responsibility um you know i the the stuff is it's more of like a mental stuff, I would say, that, that, that really is like the, the battle end of things. It's more of like when you don't feel good, how it affects your whole outlook, how it affects your days, looking ahead, planning, goal setting. It's more of like when people don't feel good, you know, it kind of, kind of fucks with their whole master plan. Totally. So that's something I've battled with since I'm 14 is like I don't feel 100%, but I also want to think 100% and I want to be normal and I want to live my life normal. And that's something I've mentally had to battle out and come to terms with and how to deal with it. And today, something I've noticed is a lot of kids that deal with illnesses and comebacks from illnesses and comebacks from surgeries and recovering, you know, getting the talks from the doctors and the counselors and people who haven't necessarily been through it themselves. They get very different kinds of advice than I give kids. And I give people dealing with an illness or a comeback. And <clears throat> I guess it's like anything. When you go through something yourself, you know, the feeling of it and how to deal with it and how to look forward and how to fight through things. I guess it's, you know, until you go through something, it's really hard to understand it and relate. You know, and that was really like where my childhood made a big turn into adulthood at 14. Um, but I'm appreciative for it because it definitely turned me into a, uh, a life monster. That's that's what you need. That's what you need to run Miles Goldstein. So, yeah, listen. I mean, I don't wish it on anybody. I don't wish anybody discomfort or illnesses or stuff. You know, but life's a fucking box of chocolates, right? You know, just to quote my boy. But you know, you never know what you're gonna deal with. You know, and that's like that prepared me for all the shit I deal with today. When I say shit, I mean like nonsense. You know. Mm -hmm. The good, the bad, the markets, the this market, the buyers, the sellers, you know, kind of like sets you up, 
you know, and I don't think everyone has to go through illness stuff to, to get there, right, mentally. You know, I think people can take stories like this, and that's why I think podcasts are incredible. You know, people can grasp on and relate to other people for all sorts of reasons. You know, somebody may connect with what I'm saying having nothing to do with illness, but just in the matter of they went through some shit, you know, and they're battling it and coming back from it and fighting through it and dealing with looking ahead and being positive and seeing the greater message of it all and the greater purpose of it all. And that's really, you know, at this point in my life, I just turned 36, you know, I've been dealing with this stuff for a long time. And it's like, it's a massive base of it. Um, And I've just layered, it's like compounded experience, just one after the other on top of each other and how to get through stuff. It's amazing. Yeah, that's really what we're all going to have different great and shitty experiences. And I like the the Forrest Gump Gump reference because it's very accurate. I know what you're going to get. Absolutely. So after all of this happened to you, what, how did you end up in real estate? I mean, that's the ultimate question. How did you find this business? Were you working for someone else? How did that start? So basically I had a master plan, but like all master plans, there was every time you say master plan, I think of, uh, Austin powers for some reason. That's okay. I'll take a gold member. Um, there was a master plan and like all master plans, it didn't go to plan. You know, I had full intentions of going into law school right out of college. In my mind as a kid, throughout my life, because I talked a lot and I had a big mouth, I thought, oh, you go be a lawyer, like in the movies. You know, everybody saw the movies and it's like, oh, you like to argue and you have a big mouth and be like, oh, you got to be a lawyer. You're going to be a lawyer. Great. So I thought I'm going to be a lawyer. And uh, that was my plan. Go through college, come out of college, go into law school. They'll let me in because I have a big mouth. Wasn't the case at all. So much so that... You know, I don't come from academics as parents. They're brilliant people. My dad was a, an aeronautical engineer, very smart guy, far smarter than me. My mom was a school teacher, far smarter than me. Um, but let's just say that they didn't have the blueprint of how to go to an incredible college and how to go into law school and what all the what the steps are to enter that path. You know, unless you go through it or you have parents that walk you through it or you really look into it, you know, people don't really give you the the path to take. So not coming from that world, nobody really told me, you know, Alex, you want to go to a, a law school or a great law school, you got to get great grades. You know, that part really didn't didn't uh, come into perspective so much. Granted, when I went into college and even through high school, like my focus and concerns weren't so much on getting amazing grades. I was just thankful to be alive at that point. I was thankful to literally wake up every day and have fun. My dad told me every single day of my life, have fun, right? You know, and that's what I did. You know, I looked for living experiences and it was probably not the best plan of action if I was looking to go be a lawyer, right? Just to get into law school, to get into a good law school, to to take that path. That wasn't where my head was at at all. So I was all over the place grades wise, you know, again, I was, uh, I didn't get to get into this yet, but part of my recovery after being sick was, was becoming active again. I couldn't walk, you know, I had hip to hip surgery. It was a 14 inch scar across my stomach. Um, I was walking, leaning over like in a 90 degree angle for months. Um, Just because it was like, yeah, I mean, you were, I was closed shut essentially like this. So part of my recovery was getting into sports again. Um, The first thing I ever jumped into was surfing, believe it or not. Um, My dad took me, we went and borrowed a surfboard from one of my buddies. I'll never forget him giving me that surfboard, epic gift. Um, Walked out into the ocean, I rode my first wave. And that was like my step into athletics, my path to recovery. Um, Exercise athletics, that really took me from... I wouldn't say feeling bad about myself, but it took me to another level of confidence. Once I realized that, okay, I could get back into life and living and having fun and playing sports again. Mm -hmm. Once I got the taste of that again, I just ran full force. Got into surfing, which took me into swimming. um, And that ultimately took me into water polo. And in high school, I joined the water polo team. um, And I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the team concept. I fell in love with the sport concept. I fell in love with setting goals and accomplishing them. And then I saw myself physically getting better. And as I got physically better, I got mentally better. And then it was like a cycle and I was all in. Mentally, I was all in. I was arranging for our team to practice at six o'clock in the morning. Our teams never had morning practices. I was studying what teams are doing around the country, you know, to be that level, to get great. And then I figured out a lot of kids were getting recruited to colleges. And I was like, fuck, you know, like maybe I'll, go to college with this and maybe I'll play in college. Granted, I was, I'm 5'7 now, I was probably like 
four seven, <laughs> seventy pounds. I mean, I if you look at a water polo player, I'm like the size of his leg for the most part. Oh, they're big people. For the most part, okay. um, I was big mentally, you know. But <clears throat> you know, so I had this fire in me, you know, and I ran with it those years, and that just took me down this endless path, you know, of of just and to this minute I'm like that, you know. This it was like physical, mental connection, spiritual co- connection. It just all connected for me deeply. And I ran with it 100 miles an hour. And um, I got good, for me at least. And it just drove me to the point where I ended up being the captain of the team. I ended up um, ended up becoming all-county. I was all-American. Got myself recruited to an amazing college. Um, a college that probably wouldn't have even looked at me if I didn't play water polo. The coach called me. We were at an award ceremony um, for water polo in high school, and I got a call on my cell phone from the coach of the team from from Penn State, and it was epic. I remember my mom was like crying. It was like a huge deal for us. Wow. I don't know what school I would have ended up in if I would have even but been in school. Here's the thing of water polo: you, you can make a decent amount of money doing that. It doesn't exist professionally in the United States. It's mm-hmm. professional in your in Europe and other countries around the world, but not in the U.S. yet. It's a barbaric sport, an aggressive barbaric sport, which is part of the reason it's not been professional in america Uh, dude i don't even know what the game's like i have to check it out it's like a mix of wrestling hockey basketball football soccer in the pool with no pads no protection and just barely any rules it's a very barbaric sport gladiator-esque in the water which i loved granted again i was like four seven seventy pounds wrestling with guys in the water and i thought it was epic um i loved it it was a hell of an experience it was amazing great that took me down to the next path, which was going to college with this. You know, I got recruited in 11th grade. Um, by senior year, I knew I was going to Penn State to play polo. And that was it. You know, that was where my mindset was. And then in college, playing sports, I was practicing twice a day. I played varsity. We traveled every other weekend around the country, which was epic. Um, but again, my focus wasn't on grades. So when, you know, flash forward four years, when I was looking towards law school, you know, I ended up with a triple core degree. I scheduled all my classes myself without talking to advisors, which was real interesting in itself and very much the way I do things. Not saying everybody should do this, but I I went and scheduled classes based off what I liked. I would go online and schedule classes. I was like, oh, marketing, I like that. Oh, psychology, I think that looks interesting. Oh, political science, this looks very interesting. So I took a ton of classes in different shit. Mm -hmm. I ended up sitting with an advisor and they're like, Alex, like you've taken classes in, in fucking 10 different majors you know if you commit to a fifth year in college you could probably end up with a triple core degree and all this i was like amazing let's do it i called my mom and dad i'm like guys i'm like i can get a triple core degree if i do five years that that my mom and dad are like great do fucking five years enjoy blah 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 and i agreed to it At the end of the fourth year i was already in in the office at penn state trying to finagle my way to finish my fifth year online because i wanted to go home with everybody else all my friends were leaving college um, and this is where I found out that law school was not so interested in my varsity water polo playing, my triple core degree. They wanted to see a whole different animal at that time, for me at least. And I didn't get into law school. And that was my major turning point. Another turning point. Um, probably the second biggest turning point in my life. I'll never forget the moment where I opened up on my phone, like looking to check like the status of the applications, you know? <clears throat> we were waiting on the final one to see. I didn't get in. I remember calling my mom hysterical. I'm not going to be a lawyer. Da, da, da. Hysterical. I let myself feel sorry for myself for like 40 minutes. 40 minutes later, I signed up for the real estate exam because I figured out that was the fastest career I can jump into immediately. Because mindset was, I figured I'll jump into business for one year and after a year, I'll go into fucking law school. Like I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll make them let me in. I'll figure something out, right? 40 minutes later, signed up for the fucking class. I started the class that night. No exaggeration. I was already like, I was just moving. I was like, what the fuck am I going to do? I'm like, I got to do something right now. Friends of mine were going into law school. They're celebrating their acceptances. And here I am like, oh, I paid four years of college polo and I was all American and I got a triple core degree. Law schools didn't give a fuck. Okay. They don't give give a shit. Yeah. So, you know, this was my moment, another moment of getting punched in the face, you know, but I took the hit and I ran. And I started to love the concept of real estate. Started to really dive into it. I started to research my brains out about the biggest brokers in America, the biggest brokers in the world. I would study them. I'd read what they did, read what they read, eat what they eat. Like I would really, I was just immersed into it. And um, 
that took me down just an endless path because I fell in love with the business. I fell in love with the people part. I fell in love with the negotiation part, the face-to-face stuff, the marketing. It was like a huge mix of everything I loved. Um, But still in the back of my head, I was like, I want to be a lawyer. You know, I still, because I went down this with like this backup plan and these options, I still had looked at it as a part-time gig. I still wasn't convinced this was my play. A year goes by, I was into it. I hadn't sold a house. First year, I didn't sell a house. Barely made money. I made money the most quirky fucking ways you can ever imagine. I would set up photo shoots at houses with, one of my best friends would let me use cars from their dealership to make dick, you know, just to fucking get by. But I would make connections and I would get experience and I'd be talking to people and it was, you know, in hindsight, that was like my buildup. Where did you start off? I started off at Sotheby's. Okay. There was an epic woman who interviewed me and gave me my shot. Her name is Randy Rapp. She's still around today. We haven't spoken in a while, but she remembers it. We met at Epicure, the old Epicure in Sunny Isles. And she she opened up the door for me to take me down this road. And that's where I began my career. Granted, I was working more than I was in school. Um, but, you know, after about two years, I, I started to have this idea that I wanted to go down the road real estate full time, but differently than I was. And then I started to have the idea of I wanted to start a brokerage. How I got that idea was probably from studying some of the other people around the country that did that, that went this boutique mom and pop style company. Um, And I ran with that concept mentally. And then I figured out that I was dealing with lawyers a lot. As I started to get more business, rentals and small deals and small listings, and I realized I was dealing with lawyers all the time. And that that made me even more want to go and do that. couple years later you know I think I was into it for like two years or so I wrote the dean of a law school letter and oh, so you were still committed to law school two years st- into real estate I was still into it I was still wow. I was still going after this do you think part of it was because you were rejected and all your other friends got 100 in 100 fucking percent so you're 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 the beast in you is like this isn't fucking happening this this is mine I'm taking this I wanted the you education okay. I did and I didn't know why yet but I did I wanted it and so subconsciously I was working towards that at all times and I got into law school uh St. Thomas University in Miami gave me my shot and I'm forever grateful for it and I went to law school and I worked full-time in law school I took it on myself you know this wasn't going to be a gift from my parents this was on me um and I worked my fucking way through law school I would be in classes and stepping out of classes to take calls with clients I'd be negotiating deals in and out of classes you know people could People at the time thought I was out of my mind, and I probably was. You know, I risked a lot. You know, considering the fact that I'd committed to law school, I'd committed to paying for law school, I'd committed to student loans. You know, I had committed to a lot, and I was out there hustling my business on the side because I really didn't feel like I had a choice. So, mixed school with my growing experience of business, I was just like spiraling, spiraling, spiraling in a good direction, not bad direction. It was good. It was just building compounded experience, compounded knowledge. I was learning the laws. I was learning how people use the laws and through law school, I started to really consider whether I was going to go down that road. I interned in the public defender's office for some time. I represented people who couldn't afford lawyers. That was a fucking epic experience for me. Mm-hmm. Um, again, more practice, dealing with strangers, dealing with business, dealing with people's personal lives, emotions, lots of fucking emotions. Um, and looking back, that probably set me up a lot for the future emotion issues I was going to deal with with people. You know, it's funny. I tell people all the time, like, you never know in the moment what you're being set up for, you know, but like if you have the faith that you're going in the right direction and you're doing the right thing and you're a good person, you got to have that faith that you're going in the right way. And I did. You know, I, I trusted in it. You know, I trusted in the divine that I was going the right way. That's so important. The faith component is so big. My faith has only gotten stronger and deeper and more bulletproof as I've gotten older. Um, Those years, it was very, let's just say that I was always like behind the cusp. I was watching my friends become lawyers. I was watching people in real estate just fucking crush it. And I was sitting in class, you know, sitting in law school, taking on hundreds of thousands in debt, you know, while working on the side while having these options of careers and then i you know i was always like not waiting for my shot because i was working on it at all times but like i had this 
fire in the back of my head waiting to just fucking explode. But I knew that this was all, I believed in the faith of it, that it was, it was going its route and its process and its pace for a reason. So, so what, no, go on. No, no, I was just going to say, you know, coming towards the end of law school, having done my internship, considering all the different routes of what I could do with law, I was signed up to take the bar, which is to get licensed to be an attorney. The week I graduated law school, went to graduation, that was an unbelievable experience for me, for my family, just overall, it was epic. You know, it's just a, such a, an accomplishment of something I had been after my whole life. Plans to take the bar, I paid to take the bar, I paid for my bar review class, a couple thousand dollars. The week I graduated, I was like, I'm not taking the bar. I was like, I'm gonna go start my brokerage. I went and I filed for a company, I did all the company shit. You really, you didn't even wanna take the bar, no. you were so close. I was so close, I had finished law school, I got my degree. I was certain that my path was to go start this company. I was positive, I didn't care, I didn't give a fuck. It was one of these moments again in my life that people thought I was absolutely out of my mind, which has happened a lot. But here's which, my question, why didn't you at least wanna pass the bar so you have it? The so you have it mindset, you know, I'm one of these at that moment in my life, and I wasn't always that way. By then, I was very much in the mindset of I wanted to burn my ships. I, had a, I knew you were going to go there. Yeah. You know, and I'm not, I'm not advising this for everybody, and I'm not advising anybody anything, you know, but for me personally, at that moment in time, I had made the decision that I wasn't going to give myself another option. That at that moment, I knew what my calling was for then in my life, for that moment in my life. I also knew that in 10 years from then, I could go take the bar I, or, you know, figure out how to go get my law license if I wanted to at any point in time. But at that moment, that year, that week, I knew where my calling was. And I went and I started a business overnight. I started a mom and pop boutique brand with nothing. At that moment, I had no clients. I had no listings. You had had, no, did you have an office? Where'd you do it out of? No office. Just I yourself. had to legally get an office because in the state of Florida, for licensing purposes, you needed a standing office that you could have private meetings in. There's a couple of regulations for the state. So I got an office. I didn't have an office. I was mm -hmm. at the moment still under Sotheby's before I started my company. Um, and yeah, had to go fulfill a ton of these requirements. But at that moment, it was, I was certain of my path. Um, and I ran 100 miles an hour. And that was the start of Miles Goldstein Real Estate. I remember I, I had my buddy Rashid from Genius Advertising help me out with my logo. I told him what the name was gonna be. One of my guys that started this company with me, he was one of the founding members of the company, he helped me out. You know, which, which logo, the colors, we considered doing the colors, green and white, blue and white. And then eventually we were like, Gold, Goldstein. We looked at it and he gave me mock-ups of my logo and I was like, this is fucking it. Like, and once I saw it and it started to just come to fruition, it was like, we were just flying. And that was it, and I never looked back after that. Wow, that's amazing. So, several questions. When you were in Sotheby's, did you have a lot of sales? Were you killing it? Were you making a no. lot of money? I didn't have a lot of sales okay. um, at all. You know, and, and as was far two as- two years? You, so you, were in, you started your brokerage two years at, into real estate? Well, no. I was still with Sotheby's as I went through law school. So oh, I didn't okay. start the company. I was probably with Sotheby's for four-ish years, give or take. Through law school, maybe four to five years. Through law school, okay, prior to sense. law school. Okay. I didn't start the business till I was out of law school. So I was not killing it by any means. Um, but personally speaking, I knew and I felt what my skills were and what they would be as I worked on them and got experience and got better at what I was doing. And that kind of lit the fire in me of where I was going with this and who I was going to create to be, which is a whole nother side of this conversation because I knew in my mind what I needed to become to be successful in this world and in this real estate world as a brokerage owner and a company owner. And I committed myself 100%. Wow. So you weren't even killing it before you started this brokerage, no. but you knew you needed to start the brokerage in order for you to become the person you needed to become. It I don't think it was it. that I needed to start it to become that. I think that I knew who I wanted to become in a professional setting. And I felt that starting my company was my calling. I felt that beginning this brokerage 
was going to be what fulfilled me the most because there was another side to it. You know, I felt like I always knew that I was a good salesman and I could sell and I could close deals. I felt that. But then I felt that I could also lead others to do it. And that was really where I went down the road of starting the company. And why I felt that is in the past, like in athletics and in college, I gravitated very much towards leading. Um, probably based upon the experiences I had being sick. Um, when I was coming out of that and I came through it and I fought through it and I was excelling and getting better, I felt this like necessity to like help other people and guide them, not necessarily through health stuff, but just like in general, like I just felt like a calling to help people, um, which led me to be the captain of my swim team, the captain of my water polo team, um, and in a leader position, you know, when people would be second questioning a game or a match or a race, you know, I was the guy yelling in their face, you know, that we're going to fucking win and we're champions and, you know, fuck everybody. And, you know, our swim team, for example, we had never gotten to some levels as a school. Same with water polo team. We had never reached certain points in the history of the schools. And it was our passion as a team. And some of those people are my best friends to this minute. You know, we had this fucking drive. Like if you were getting in the pool against us, we weren't the biggest, the best. We were not even close but we wanted it so bad that it's like you fucking smelled it before you got in the pool. We were like that group chanting on the side of the pool, like complete psychos. We would wear, you know, everyone was wearing Speedos, right? Like we wouldn't wear team color Speedos. We would get fucking pink and we would get white and we would get like baby blue and picture. skulls. Do you, do you have a picture in pink Speedos? Too many. We should, probably, um, we should probably post this. That was our attitude. Our attitude was fuck you, you know, and very much that. like Miles Goldstein's mindset, not fuck you in the sense, but like, you know, we're very much, we went into this business, you know, David versus Goliath. You know, right. we're a mom and pop against multi-billion dollar corporations. And, you know, sky's the limit. And that's really was always our mindset. And it bled through everything we ever did. So, okay. So what's your, what is your value in terms of more of a boutique brokerage? Why was that your direction as opposed to trying to create, say, another compass or another Sotheby's what's the value in having something smaller so for me I <clears throat> I really saw the value and the effect on being real hands-on with people and I always wanted to avoid overcomplicated scenarios for me myself mm -hmm. um, and when it came to like the company and starting the company and once we did you know considering growth and movements and spending money and I, from the start, was always like, well, what my ultimate goals are or X, Y, Z, you know, do I need Q, L, and F, you know? And I made judgment calls as far as how to keep the company lean and mean and really stick to what I felt was necessary for the success of the business and myself and as a company and our reputation. And I just, from the start, felt like the smaller size business for me the control of it, the involvement. Because look, I mean, I'm realistic. You know, if I have 25 agents in the company, which is basically what we have today, versus 150, my involvement to each of those people can only be X. It's just what it is today. Maybe I figure out a way to get larger and more in control and I'll decide that. But something for me was I wanted to run this company like a traditional brokerage in the sense of I'm the broker of the company. So agents that work within me, you know, within my firm and under me as, an, as a broker agent, I'm able to guide them. Mm -hmm. You know, that is how the brokerage started. You know, not just my brokerage, but the brokerage concept as a business entirely began with a broker. That's why by law, you need to work under a broker for two years before you can be a broker yourself. The concept of this was because of the guidance aspect. Now, if I were to become a massive size corporation, you know, I would need to, or I would probably hire managers and sales managers and people beneath me running other groups beneath and beneath and beneath. And yeah, I could see how that could make the company a ton of money and make me, you know, maybe more money. I don't know. But, you know, as far as how I wanted to run my company, that's not at all even close to where I wanted to be. You know, I enjoy probably the most thing I enjoy about my business is watching people come into my firm who had never sold a house, who never had a client, who never did any of this, turn their personal business into a self-sustaining brand company within my company 
you know, that has been fulfillment wise, hands down the largest fulfilling thing I've done yet. Watching people go from nothing in this career to brokering and making, I mean, a living is epic. It's just special. And I don't think I would have that satisfaction and enjoyment if I were so detached. I think my attachment, involvement, my guidance is why I enjoy it as much as I do. And if I stop enjoying what I'm doing, I'm no longer doing it. Mm -hmm. Because I'm, you know, granted, this goes back to when I was a sick kid. I made the decision I was never going to not enjoy what I'm doing, you know, and I know there's all these like sales gurus and guys who are like, ah, fuck enjoyment and fuck, you know. I hate when I hate when I hear that. By the way, listen, <clears throat> you gotta you gotta listen to what aligns with you. And 100%. for me personally, you know, the success and enjoyment it's it's they're intertwined. You know, success for me is not the financials are like number six on the list of importance of the word success. You know, at the tippy top of the word success is me loving my days. And with that, obviously, it intertwines with, you know, financial financial success. I'm not a clown, you know, on the beach playing, you know, which, you know, I may want to do that one day. And if mm -hmm. I do, you know, and then someone doesn't like it too bad, you know, but the reality is like, I'm going to do what I want to do. Right. You know, it's my life and it's everyone else's lives. And if there's any advice I can give anybody is don't listen to the people that tell you like, it's okay to hate every single day of your life. Like that's a bunch of bullshit. Um, that's usually people just trying to get you to pay attention by being aggressive. Um, the reality is we got one life and you know, if you look back in the last 10 years of your life and you were just like, yeah, well I hated every second of it and I was just fucking miserable, you know, it's a sad story. It's not at all the way I would, I would think anybody wants to look back mm -hmm. on their time. If I was making 300 K as an accountant, I'd fucking hate it. I would hate it. I hate accounting. There's certain things. Even with something you love to do, there are going to be agonizing and shitty moments but it's so much easier to handle those shitty moments when you love the thing you're doing as a whole. 100%. And that's what's so important to me. And I, and I love that you said that because you, you'll you hear people who do, eh, you don't have to love what you do. Take you don't weekends. have to. Listen, you don't have to, but. I think, it's, I think it's important. I mean, you got one shot at this, you know, at this thing called life. We got one shot. So why not go and do stuff that you could get all of it out of it? You know, like mm -hmm. there's so many options for people, you know. It, you, you could literally go and, and figure out how to make a living in almost anything today. You know, the world is so wide open that figure out something you like to do, you know, and, and do it <laughs> as cut and dry as that is. Without a doubt. These are, these are some good clips we just made. So now, so you, you open the brokerage, quite a, quite a successful brokerage at that. How did you step into the luxury market? So <clears throat> I'll be, you know, I'll be completely honest. You know, it was a... Uh, we went after our first client. It was a an owner of a home. And in when Golden you say we, to, to, to quickly our interject. firm, I speak we. You know, no, no, I know what you mean. But how many people were how at many this guys? point? Two. Just it you was and me your and one other agent. Okay. It was his name's Adi. He was with me from back when I went into Sotheby's. I brought him into the industry because I knew he would crush it also, and he did. Um, and you know, we were like two of us at that point, maybe. By the time we hit our stride, we had brought in one or two more people towards the end of year one, which is 2016. Um, I had gotten wind that there was an owner trying to sell a house themselves in a neighborhood in Golden Beach. And I reached out to them and they agreed to meet with me. What was the price they were looking for? Six to seven million. I had never had a listing that expensive. I had never sold anything that expensive. What was the one? What was the highest before that one? <laughs> One, uh, I'm sorry, it was like, I know what it was, it was 2.85. That was my biggest sale to, up until then. Listen, that's a lot of money, it's no joke. You know, we're, we're super numb to these numbers in South Florida. Everyone, million, million, million in, but the reality is, you know, if you look at the big picture in America, these are huge numbers. Three million dollar sales are huge fucking huge. For most states. And huge. I remind my company of this, and I remind myself of this, we're very, we, we bec you become numb to it, but the reality is, I mean, we're talking multi-million dollar deals, this is no joke. So yes, I had a big sale. I haven't done those deals yet, and I know I will, but okay. it, it's like you, with the podcast. You just said it right. You know you will. I absolutely know. And that's it. There's and no question. Will. So, you know, look, that that was like our leading number. And to give you an idea, I hadn't done that deal for like maybe a year and a half before I had this first meeting. So it wasn't like I was like consistently brokering multi-million dollars. I was not that guy yet. 
mentally I was. And if you talk to me at that point in time, I fucking was 100%. I knew it. Like there was no doubt. I wouldn't even blink at you. It was coming. I was there. And it's funny, yesterday in a company meeting, I talked about how I interviewed for a TV show to sell houses. I hadn't sold a house yet. And I got the show. That's the most epic part about this. I was given the show. I didn't take it. I went into law school instead. But I fucking convinced producers to give me a TV show. Never sold a house before based on selling houses, which was epic. I knew it. You know, there was no doubt in my mind what was coming. It was just when and how and what was the story behind it, but it was coming. And it did. Um, So we got wind that this family was going to sell. And I went and I emailed them. I got their email somehow. And I wrote them a fucking aggressive email to give me five minutes of their time. And they did. And they sat me down <clears throat> and I went to war. And they smelled it. And they didn't give a fuck that I hadn't sold billions and I wasn't on a team with 80 people and that it wasn't number one on earth. And they didn't care. They smelled the passion. They smelled the drive. They smelled that I was going to be committed to them. I was going to protect them. That I cared. You know, the, the things that I coach our brokers into today the real focus of the things, not the fluff, the real shit. And they smelled it and they gave me a shot. And that was our first company listing. And that year, our first year in business, we had three listings by the end of that year. That one for 7 million, we had a condo for like 3 million. And then one of my guys that worked with me, Adi, he brought in Jason Derulo's house, the singer. Um, How did he land that? He landed that because he was such a good guy with somebody who was connected to him and they did the layup for us and this is another reason why you got to be good and do good things and be a good human because people help out good people very often and my guy was just a good guy and i i try to surround ourselves our company and our people with good people not just for that reason just because i don't like to surround myself with shit um but yeah that's really how that happened and that's really how you know Year one, we, we brought in Jason Derulo's listing, but right before we sold that, right before we listed his, I had done our first company sale, which is an epic story, and it was like really the start of the run. And I'll never forget it. I was on a plane going to Aspen with my friends, like, like five of my boys. And <clears throat> I know it sounds luxurious, Aspen. At the time, I was dead broke. I still owed money to law school, a ton of money to law school. I'd gotten our first listing. I was editing the movie on the plane. For the listing, I edit all my own movies. I do everything with with our company. Um, I was editing the movie, and I was. When you say the movie, you're talking the the, the, the vid- video of our the video listing. Of the I was listing. editing it on the How plane, like I was just. You did it yourself. So we had a company, Lux Hunters, my boy Zoltan, who's been my guy from day one. I ride with him till the end. They are some of the most talented artists I've ever worked with. He would send me all the clips, and I'd work with him on. I want to see from one second to ten seconds. I want to see this from ten seconds to twenty seconds. I want to see that. And we'd work together on creating these masterpiece movies. We've done probably fucking 300 of these movies by now, billion, a billion in them. Um, at this point, this was our first one. I'll never forget this. I was on the plane editing, like sweating, sweating every fucking detail, my logo, how it's going to look, what order. I involved a boat. I involved a Bentley. I borrowed someone's car. You know, I would borrow toys and this because like I saw in, in other states, people would do that. And this was at a time in South Florida, people really weren't making movies at their houses. They didn't want to pay for it. And I was like, I got to do something different. I got to be different. And I ran with the movie concept. And I'll never forget, we landed on the plane in Aspen. Um, and I got a message about an off-market deal in Golden Beach on the ocean. And like a month before, somebody told me this other client was looking for something off the market in the ocean, very much how my fit, business is. And it was a perfect match. It was like a fucking match. And like, I'm telling you, like I felt something. And then I realized Sammy Sosa owned the house. The athlete, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I was like, player. holy shit. It, like, it stunned me. I was like, this is my shot. I was like, I got to do this deal. I'm like, this will get me some press. I'll have my name out there. I ran like a fucking horse. The guy I thought to buy this house, I came back from Aspen a few days later. Or re- the day I landed, I had an appointment at this house with the guy. It wasn't for the guy. We made an offer with him, didn't work out. Two days later, we were in contract on the deal. It was over $9 million. That was my first sale with the company. It's my biggest sale at that time in my life. 9.15 million to be exact. Um, I'll never forget it. We closed that deal and that was like my first time I ever saw my name written, like in, you know, like, like published, like on an article. Like it was like the real deal or Curbed at the time was another website really doing well. 
um, I'll never forget that feeling. Seeing my name and rep, you know, involved in the sale of Sammy Sosa. I wrote a quote and they reprinted my quote, said by Alexander Goldstein, CEO, founder, and owner of my. I mean, it was life changing. After the deal closed, the broker, like the other broker that was involved with me in this deal, who was like a private rep of the owner, he's like, hey, Alex, who I love this guy to death. And he and I had done a ton of business together at this point. Um, by this point today, I mean, not right, right. He got he's like, I've got something else on the ocean if you have anybody. I was like, yeah, what do you have? He had something for 10 million bucks. Two months later, we closed that deal together. And that was the former home of President FDR. So how'd you get the buyer? I made a couple calls of people also looking for stuff on the ocean and like very much in our industry, you know, one thing just led to another and like the stars aligned and I closed another deal two months later for $10 million. And then we had a ton of press on that. I was on the fucking page. I was on the Herald standing in like the construction site. And then we listed Jason Derulo's house. So I went from like Sammy Sosa to FDR to Jason Derulo. And once I saw it just steamrolling, I fucking ran with that shit like fire. Started going after more agents. People started reaching out to me. Getting more listings started to happen quicker. I was attacking full force. I started to get a groove of what I would say, how I'd do it, what I'd show them. Year one, we ended the year with with two sales, the 10 million and the 915. We sold Jason Derulo's like the month or two after the new year, in like 17. I wanna say we finished 2017 with like 50, 75 million in new listings. The next year we doubled that. And every single year later, we've doubled and tripled. You know, right now we've got a few hundred million in listings, you know, between like seven, eight people. You know, we've consistently compounded our numbers, but we have gotten very good at running with what we needed to run with to compound and build. And we built fast. And we're in, we're just finishing now our seventh year in business. Wow, dude. It's amazing. It's incredible. You know, it's, it's like very much like the stars align sometimes, but I also believe you got to like, lasso the fucking stars and pull them together right. to make them align. Yeah, you have to be very aggressive. It's, it's part of it. It's part of it. You, you know, have to bring you, you things got, to you. I always tell people, you know, you, you got to make a decision on what you want. And when you decide it, it's like the universe feels it. It's like it hears it. It's like the universe smells. That motherfucker just made a decision and he's going. And like, you don't know if it's going to work out exactly the way you decide, but... Something's got to give. You got to have faith in the fact that you're moving in that direction. And you got to have faith in the faith that it's all going to culminate into what you're ultimately after. And listen, we're hungrier than we've ever been by far. I'm like a starving dog next to who I was in 2017. And if you would have asked me then, I would have told you I'd eat the version of myself today. That's just progressively who we've become. And I'm grateful for it. That's incredible. I, it's unreal. It's been a story um, and it's been a hell of a journey. And I was never like, <clears throat> I was never one of those, like, I couldn't even tell you exactly how much real estate we, I sold last year or like my company. I literally couldn't because you don't know. I don't fucking point. care. Like it's, it's like my biggest concern are, are people happy with our service? Are people happy with us? Are we doing the right thing for people? Are we protecting our people? Of course I care about my business and my personal business and growing and building, but like that's like on the, that's like much lower on my list of importance. And in my industry, you know, it's very loosely ran, you know, mm -hmm. I, that was another reason why we've had success and, and built is you got a lot of people who just don't care as much or what they care about isn't really in line with what their clients care about, you know, and that's like another thing and something that like we push heavily in our firm is like lots of agents can sell houses and look, you're an agent, you know, other agents. A lot of people can get a deal done, but are they gonna fight for every last penny? Are they gonna fight for more? Are, you, are they gonna protect their people? And like, we live by that. You know, to me, it's not enough just to like sell the house. Like, I wanna know that on the next run, and I've got one of my clients who literally said to me like, it's our home, of course you're gonna sell it. Like, that to me is <laughs> everything. I don't care about anything else. Like. When someone, because I care so much about what I do and what I put into my industry and my business, that when it connects and they feel it, that to me is my home run. It's so much more important than the commission, right? Because <laughs> there's no doubt. Money comes and goes, you spend it. And listen, I'm not mm -hmm. saying like money's not important because clearly it's important, but like 
that is so far on the bottom of what I'm concerned about that it lets me focus really on what I should be focused on. And that's really how I feel that as a firm, we've been able to build for, you know, against, when I say against, I mean like, listen, it's a competitive industry, right? You've got people fighting for business and people walking into meetings and explaining why they should work with A versus B. You know, there's a reason why we've been able to, to build up our business the way we have, because people do mm -hmm. connect to my, to our theory and our mindset and what we stand for. There's a reason. Um, and we're grateful for our clients that trust with us. And, you know, and I always am looking to better our service and better what we do for them. And I take responsibility for it because I am a hands-on traditional real estate broker for our company. Every single one of our agents, they represent our name. So I am absolutely involved and absolutely concerned about everything we all do because it's all a reflection on me and us and our firm. So we've continued to be very aware of what we do. What do you think are some of the biggest components to getting into luxury or to being, you know, top of the line in the luxury industry as opposed to, say, selling a $500,000 house? What's important to those, to those more affluent people, clients? It's funny you say it like that. Um, I'll put it to you like this. The requirements or the expectations of a luxury client versus a non-luxury client are no different. They all want protection. They all want you to fight for them. They all want you to make sure that they are walking away with everything possible, no money left on the table. Their expectations are the same. Now, as far as like, how do I put it? Like the intangibles of like a luxury listing versus not like, you know, Maybe there'll be more money spent on presenting certain real estate than others based on sheer size of a home. Maybe the details that you'd have to portray or present in a specific home versus another. Like maybe someone would have to put a lot more time and energy in presenting a 10,000 square foot detailed modern home than versus a 1965 rehab, you know, or maybe a, a renovation project. You know, just the energy and mindset and. I think a lot of it comes down to deciding what you want to represent, you know, what connects with you the best. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's some people that want nothing to do with luxury sales, you know, and I think that there's some people that want nothing to do with lower end sales. And look, it's also a real relative Why term. Why would someone not want to deal with luxury sales? If they, had, um, if they had them, they'd probably take them, no? I don't know. You know, listen, I, I, I always like the way that we work in our company to give you an idea, like, yeah, we specialize on expensive stuff. Um, but what I've come to realize is that word expensive is, is it's real relative, you know, like it's, it depends who you're talking to, you know, to one guy expensive is 500 K and to one guy expensive is 150 K and another guy expensive is 10 million. And then it could be 20 million, 30 million, 50 million, a hundred million. And that's why it's like, it's fucking endless. Right. So it really like, if you put the focus on what the client's expectations are versus like how expensive things are. That to me is really how things start to get momentum. Rather than focusing on, I wanna go sell $10 million houses, I wanna sell $2 million houses, 500K houses, 200K houses, like ultimately you gotta decide like what kind of an environment do you wanna be working in? What kind of a, you know, what kind of levels do you wanna be selling? And listen, it's, it's to each their own, you know? Again, it's like, it's all relative what your version of expensive is. Mm -hmm. Because look, the same guy doing 50 500k sales a year versus the guy doing one two million dollar sale you know listen it's it's there's a value in volume too financially it really comes down to how you want to be spending your time and how you want to be selling and what you want to be selling someone may enjoy selling a ferrari more than selling a toyota you know as far as like the actual sale end of it and again that's one of the beauties of my business you know you can kind of mold this and go after really what you want to be doing and sell what you want to be selling okay so, so do you have 500K sale? I mean, I assume you do. You have lower end sales? Saying, let's say a 300K listing comes we, in. We've you... got people in our firm that, that specialize in all ends of it. We've got people in our firm that specialize in leases. I've got a couple guys that are just lease animals. They just understand the ins and outs of leasing deeper than, say, I even do. That's what they do. They love it. They love working with rental clients. They like the speed of it. They like the environment of it. They like the... They like the whole process of that versus the, versus the let's say the year long listing agreement on a fifteen million dollar house. That say you ha could have a showing 
once every two weeks if the price is, say, a little bit higher than it should be. Very different environments and very different mindset of how you're managing your clients' expectations, how you're managing your time, their time, other people's time. What you go after is going to lay out a whole nother, you know, path of experience. So it's like I tell agents that come to work with me, you know, it's like decide, you know, what route you'd like to take and go, you know, whether it's lower, higher, middle, and just attack. The thing with leases are, I mean, unless you're getting relatively higher end leases, you're going to have a pretty big ceiling. I mean, you're not going to be able to, unless you're getting 5K rentals, 10K rentals, 20K rentals, if all your rentals are... 18, 2000, $2,500, it's going to be very hard to really, what are you going to be left with? Eight, maybe 60 to 80K at the end of the year if you're killing it with rentals? Depends. Listen, there's people that do a ton of rentals a month and they get big. Today, rentals in these cities are expensive. You know, volume is volume. Mm-hmm. That's the reality. You know, so I wouldn't look at it so much as like how much you could be left with at the end of the year, so much as like you get a lot of experience doing leases, a lot. You're dealing with people, you're dealing with paperwork, you're dealing with the processes of things. In my early years in the business, I did do a lot of leases. You know, it was, it's fast, you know, much faster than say sales can be. And people are usually making decisions quicker. Um, And for agents that are say new in the business or not even new, but speed is a factor. um, It's a whole nother just experience doing leases versus the process of listing and marketing and showing and selling expensive product Mm. totally different process so somebody may not connect to that secondary process as much as the first where you're in and out showing send the lease to contract you're in and out of deal sometimes in a day or two versus a sale where it usually takes more than a day or two (laughs) oh for sure i just i like the sales process more Mm -hmm. and I mean, I don't know, the, the whole, the, the rental thing isn't my thing. And when I say it's not my thing, and I've done them, I've done leases. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I want to get more into the sales end of things. Mm-hmm. So that's why I've primarily, most of my business has been listings mm-hmm. and most of them have been sales. Yep. Listen, you said it yourself, you know, you decide what you want to be doing. There's nothing wrong with either, you know, it's right. just a decision you make. You know, when you make that decision, the wheels start to turn, you know, and the universe starts to react to it. And that's why I say, like, okay, you decide to go that route, start moving in that direction. If you know you want to go sell luxury, you need to wholeheartedly start to move in that direction. You need to do everything you possibly can to go in that direction. What are some things you, you would suggest? You'd have to someone? come work for me to get that. I'm kidding. Um, listen, some sense. of the things I would suggest is, number one, making that decision. <laughs> a lot of people don't make that decision of what they want to actually do and sell and what area, what level. And that's probably the easiest thing to do of it all is decide. You know, once you make that decision, again, at least you know where you can attack. If you decide I want to sell mansions in Miami Beach, there's a certain path you should take to go eventually sell mansions in Miami Beach. If you know you want to be the condo king of Aventura because there's fucking thousands of them here, you can go and take a certain path to become the condo king of Aventura. But the, probably the stupidest thing you could do is not decide at all and be like, oh, well, I'll, I'll see how it goes. You know, that is like you're, you're working just aimlessly in, into thin air, you know, right. and that to me is like the, the biggest no, no of it all. You know, I think that people need to make a decision, what they want to attack and then come up with a plan and attack. Okay. I hear you. So, so in terms of real estate in general, you always advise to pick a certain neighborhood and get very, very good at that neighborhood or would you say, cause I know obviously Golden Beach. I'm a big believer in knowledge. It sounds stupid, but like I'm a big believer in really learning your market. So when I say markets, if you're an agent in South Florida, like you better fucking know everything. (laughs) Like I'm talking cold, memorized, memorize the numbers, study the tax records. You know, we're in a time technology speaking where I could pull out my iPhone and I could pretty much find anything. I could find out anything. You know, 20 years ago, you know, for brokers to, to go down that road and learn what they needed to learn about, probably had to go to like a fucking library, you know, totally different route. Today, Crazy. I could study the tax records on my couch on my iPhone, and I study those fucking tax records. I know who owns what houses, what they paid for them, what year they bought them, what year their renovations were. And this is what I would be spending heavy amounts of time on in the early days, and to this minute, I spend time on this. Because I'm very much a believer in knowledge is powerful, 
and in my industry, knowing as much as I possibly could about everything is very important to me. And I think very important to my clients and for their greater good of their assets. So for me, if they're hiring me, I want them to know that I'm studying tax records. I want them to know that I'm studying the growth of every one of these communities and I understand where they came from. And to understand where they're going, it really helps to have an idea where they came from. So, you know, I'm a big believer in self-study. And that's something like for my firm, you know, you ask anybody in my company what our, one of our number one requirements is, is to know your shit. You know, if you're walking around trying to sell real estate and I ask you cold what some things are selling for in the city you work in and you don't have that answer, you are not getting the business. Mm -hmm. There's no way. The owners will smell it. That's like you going to buy a, a, a Toyota and asking the Toyota dealer, you know, questions about the Toyota and him being like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to go check on my iPhone. And when I'm done researching, I'm going to come back to you. Yeah, bro, you're, you're not buying a car from that guy. 100%. There's no different. It's like anything. You go into the Apple stores, right? These motherfuckers, they know everything. Like they'll, they'll tell you what screw is on the bottom of the app. It's just training. It's, it's knowledge. It's taking the time and putting in the fucking work. And a lot of people don't want to put in the fucking work. And there's where I disconnect with some people, you know, the people that feel like there's shortcuts. Look, human beings, I think, naturally gravitate toward shortcuts. I think as a human from the beginning of time, if we see an easier way to do something, like naturally we gravitate towards it, you know? I don't think it's the, it's not the worst thing to try to make things easier, right? Like, of course, like, you know, why make life hard if it doesn't have to be? But if you know that knowing more about some things can help your greater purpose and you don't do that, yeah, it's on you. True, totally. Yeah, you lose in the long run. So that's something for me I've, I've had to really get to know, you know, because there's so many nuances, there's so many things to learn. So I guess the question for someone who I wouldn't call myself a new agent, but, you know, not, I'm also haven't been in the business for a long time, is what do you really focus on if you're in, say, the lower end industry, the uh, end of the industry, if you're in the luxury part of the industry, you know, and that's kind of what I'm trying to learn, you know, and having the mentors, having someone, especially for luxury, talking to you, talking to Austin, understanding what I need to know in a particular neighborhood, it's mm -hmm. important. Everything, everything. Absolutely. You need to know everything. You need to know what things have sold for, why, what location in those neighborhoods, did it have anything to do with why they sold for that? You know, there's so many details of these things, it's, it's fucking endless. And this is where my company focuses on, is in the details. We're very detail-oriented. And I would suggest that anybody coming into the real estate business, they get extremely detail-oriented because that it, it, the deals are done in the details. That's the reality of it. It's not done in the, the big picture. It's done in the details, at least I think. What are some absolute requirements, in your opinion, of continuing to double or triple your business year over year? What are some things other than what you mentioned? You know, <clears throat> back when I was coming through my illness stuff, and I'm still dealing with that, I realized that as I put a lot of focus on myself, it would translate outward. And what I mean by that is throughout my life, I like to always look at that age 14 as like the restart of my life. Um, from that period up until today, I've just consistently put more emphasis on bettering me. And I start with me. And I think people need to start with themselves before anything else. And what I mean by that is mind, body, and soul. And I talk about this constantly. When it comes to mind, I'm very careful what I allow into my universe. When I say universe, I mean anything I'm aware of. Reading, watching, listening, eating, you know, now we get into body, which connects ultimately to your soul, to how you act, to how you feel. And I get micro-focused on all this shit. And I don't have all the answers. I don't know exactly what it is, you know, but it's something I've just continuously focused on and worked on. So, you know, for a long time, it was the reading, you know, I was heavy and I'm still heavy into it, but I would, I'd be ingesting these, these motivational books, self-help books, you know, these books that get real deep into the science end of things, which I'm fascinated by, you know, and then I'd get even deeper into the fitness stuff and working out and like, again, you know, everyone could have their own goals when it comes to this stuff. But I felt this connection of as I improved my, what I'm ingesting mentally and physically and emotionally 
to how I'm treating my body, to how I'm taking care of myself, to the food, you know, getting even more specific on the food and my diet and just overall inward, outward, paying attention to these things. I have seen some of the biggest growth for me personally that I ever had. So I found that the deeper I get with me, the more I put the focus into me and how I feel and paying attention to how I feel and micro focusing on how I feel, the connection that I felt what it gives out is just fucking crazy. And that's like, that's where I'm at today as far as like, I'm just scratching the surface of really like how limitless I feel as far as like how when I put the focus on me, what the return is on the outside. And I mean just overall, you know, in business, in life, in family, in friendships, in relationships, just overall speaking. I mean, the the return on you putting emphasis on bettering yourself, I think is just, it's limitless. So that's something that I'm like day by day, month by month, year by year, just trying to get better at. You know, somebody asked me an epic question on my birthday recently. They were like, they're like, what's something that you'd like to not like what's your wish like what's something you're trying to better you know wh what would you love out of your next birthday you know and i was like damn that's a fucking great question and um i answered them i was like i want to progress even more from 36 to 37 than i did from 35 to 36 and i mean progress personally the rest of the stuff are details because i feel that as i progress personally and I enhance my own life, that everything else, I deal with it better. And I'm able to handle it better, I'm able to plan better, I'm able to execute better and attack better. And I'm just like in a fucking force right now. I feel like, you know, I've read a lot of people talk about like being in the flow, like they're flowing. There's no question about it. The deeper I get with me, the more I flow. There's no question. So once I realize this, now I'm just like, full on, on attack mode on myself because I feel like it's just limitless and it really is you know and the more I read about other people that feel like this I'm like reading these things I'm like damn that's exactly how the fuck I feel and it's the reality so if I can give anybody like real hardcore advice start with you you know start with the controllables control the controllables and that's honestly I think it'll take you down the path this is excellent advice so what I what I really hear about this is tighten the screws on everything. Tighten the fucking right? screws. So you, you your diet, your mental health, your physical health, your financial health, continue to tighten, pivot. Everything is sure connected. 100%. You know, I don't think you can be at your peak in one and not the other. Like I think which, you, which is crazy to me, Alex, because you have you have these fat, out of shape guys that are making millions. And it's not that it argues your point. I still very much agree with you. And I look at them and I say, if only you were in shape and you think about how much more effective you'd be. So, you know, I, I'm careful to say things like being in shape, you know, because like I don't want to make anybody feel bad. But I like to go towards more of how you feel. Okay. You know, if I have someone in my life that I care about, that's say overweight, underweight, middleweight, you know, there's overweight people that feel fucking phenomenal, you know, but I hope they're being honest when they say they're feeling fucking phenomenal, you know, and the people that I know close to me that say have battled with underweight or overweight, you know, I've tried to narrow it down with them really how they feel. Mm -hmm. And if it comes out that they don't feel great, I try to make them understand that it's worth trying to feel great. You know, not that <clears throat> the financials are going to change and I don't think you should do these things for the wrong reasons more than how you're going to feel throughout every day of your life. It's like you've got one life, you've got one shot at this. Every minute is critical. And, you know, it's like if you're not feeling your peak and your best or you're not after it. And again, I, I talk a lot about progress, right? Like I, you, you constantly see me say like progress is progress. I strongly believe it's important to remember that there is no overnight answer. There is no, well, I don't feel like this now. Tomorrow I'm going to feel like this, sir. You know, it is... A progression physically mentally emotionally when you start going down this this rabbit hole it's progression you know progress is progress even if you start with reading a paragraph a day of something important even if you start with 10 push-ups a day five push-ups a day three push-ups a day exercising if you go for a walk for five minutes a day progress is fucking progress i don't care what anybody says 
you know, I don't think people need to like wake up tomorrow and go run 11 miles if they never exercised, but you better start somewhere and track your progress. Write it down what you did that day and then the next day and then the next day. And if it's five minutes, make the next day six and then seven and then eight and then eight minutes and 30 seconds and so on and so forth. And I strongly believe in progress is progress mm -hmm. because of my own personal experience. You know, when I was in my initial recovery of my surgeries and I was doubled over in a 90 degree angle, you know, if I would have wanted the immediate, you know, end goal of like being able to stand up and run and play water polo and swim and surf and blah, 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 I would have never gotten to where I needed to go. But my focus was on the progress. So when I went from standing like this to this, to this, to this, there was all progress and times and, and time invested into becoming that. And same thing with the business and same thing with my health and with the sports, progress is progress. And I think people need to focus on the progress, not so much on the end goal, personally speaking. It's phenomenal advice, very sound advice. I love it, man. It's of course, amazing. my pleasure. Um, so I'm just trying to think of, of some last quick, one question I had for you. Tell me. With the money that you make, say you close a $10 million deal, you make your commission, what are your primary investments? Where do you typically put your money? Aside from back in the business, obviously, mm -hmm. Where are you putting it? Are you investing in real estate? Are you developing real estate, stocks, bonds, whatever whatever it is? What are things that you do? At this moment in time in my life, the investments have gone into, I bought my first home last year. I was not a homeowner until last year, which was always an interesting thing for me, brokering homes and not, ownering, not owning a home yeah, yet. How come you waited that long to do it? Surprise. Um, timing's everything. Okay. It just... The stars didn't align for me to buy my real estate yet. Um, I have not invested in anything else yet other than my home, myself, my business, my family. You know, I am, uh, I don't trade stocks yet. I don't uh, trade anything yet. I don't do any of that. I don't do stocks either. And Just listen, the teach their own. Right. Um, but yeah, I am a lean, mean machine. And I, I watch everything pretty carefully. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big, big believer in investing in yourself. You know, not just financially, but every way. And I think I've made that clear on this podcast. But I'm a big self-investor into me. Because I believe that we are our biggest assets. Even bigger to me than my home. You know, to me, to keep that machine going, this machine's got to be at its peak. And so that's why I put a lot of the energy into making sure that I'm at my best personally so I can make sure the other machines run to their uh, their best. Okay, okay, that's interesting. No, I just definitely, because I know a lot of, I mean, I wouldn't say a lot, but there are definitely realtors that also own property, like mm -hmm. multiple rental properties. I just kind of was curious to know if you. Big picture it, speaking, I would love to go down that road. Um, I think that my, here's another reason why I've held off on that. You know, I believe that I like, personally, I like to do things when I feel ready when I feel that my experience has prepared me for that moment in time. And I think that all of my business experience and life experience has been compounding to take me to the next phase of my life, which I would like to invest in more real estate. I would like to be a landlord and provide people with an incredible living experience. I think that through what I've been through, that is something I have on my radar for the future. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll enjoy it. And I think I'll find a lot of satisfaction from providing great living for people. If you gotta kick a few people out, uh, big, big scary Alex has to do what he has to do. Big and scary are not the uh, things that I describe myself, but some big scary goals for sure. Absolutely, dude. <laughs> I, I like that. I like the um, you've the the scary massive goals has already. I mean that's your your thing. Scary massive goals. I live by this. I think that that is a critical part of life. It is something I will ingrain in my son's brain as he gets older. How important it is to have scary massive goals. And I think that scary massive goals is is different for everybody. You know, everybody's gonna have different scary massive goals. What yours are and mine are gonna be very different, and that's okay. That's mm -hmm. what makes the world go round. And that's the beauty, but I think it's important to have them and set goals because if you don't have goals and you don't set them, you ain't getting them. 100%. <laughs> You're not getting something you don't want. You know, it'll come to you. It'll come. But like if you want something, you know, you got to get it. 100%. That's the way it works. 100%. And it's, it's amazing to see 
the small achievements and then you can kind of rack them up you collect them together put them on a shelf i'm trying to kind of give give this sort of analogy where you have a bunch of small wins and when you look at each of them individually they might not be that exciting but when you put them all together you realize how long it took and how de- how devoted you were to getting them you put them all together on the shelf you realize that they they collectively add up to quite a big achievement it's compounded power and it's everything's beautiful. compounded the it's experience beautiful. the energy what you've been through your sales your friends your relationships everything's compounded for better or worse right like that that could go one direction or another but it's the idea so is true, to keep though. it in a positive direction 100% because it can spiral negatively too it can compound Correct. negatively yeah man I mean I see it with everything you know the podcast for me has been it's in a sense easier to be consistent and what I mean by that is it's not that I wasn't consistent in real estate it's I think I've mentioned this to you having that guest every week I can guarantee that mm-hmm. you know what I mean so just having my goal of I remember I had this goal of 350 subscribers, 500 subscribers. And I was like, wow, I can't wait to get to 1,000. Now I'm at a, you know, almost 1,500. And it's like, what the fuck's for 1,500, you know? Listen. And then my next is 10. And once I'm at 10, I know I'm going to say, all right, 10, great, which I'll be very proud of. Mm-hmm. Let's get to 100, you know? Mm-hmm. And I love those little, and seeing that it's actually possible, right? Now the thousands behind me already, you know? It's because you set that goal. You know, you put it out there. That's what you wanted. And the universe started working for you in that way. And like you said, you've every week been at this. Bro, one of the reasons that we're doing this right now is because you're you're attacked. You know, you pushed and pushed and pushed. And that's what it takes. And the reason you pushed is because you knew what you wanted. And it's not that it's me. It's that your greater goal of what you're after, you're aware of it. And you've put it out there and you don't give a fuck. And that's it's what beautiful. this comes down to. And it's beautiful. That's what life is. I love it, dude. There's nothing, you know, you said to me something that, you know, before we started, you you said like, you feel it in your gut that like you, you want to do this, you know, you got to run with that fucking feeling and you are, you're running with it. And that's why we're sitting here. But you know, that to me, something people got to pay attention to. They got to pay attention to their feelings. They got to pay attention to, it's funny, you know, I, I, the other day I said something about like, fuck how you feel, you know, And, and I didn't mean in the sense of like feeling like emotionally or like stressed or stuff like that i mean in the sense of like you gotta go with your hunch you know go with your gut and sometimes your gut will tell you everything you need to know and i try to follow that you know what it is i think some people don't develop enough of a confidence in that gut where they they get they second guess it too much the more you what i've realized is the more you go with your gut and it pans out well the next time you have another gut feeling you go oh i've been there before let's fucking go 100% 100% you know and this for a, to a large degree it started with my army experience mm-hmm. I, I've had other gut feelings that I've gone with whether it be a dating experience or some other business idea uh, the army for me was probably the stepping stone where I, I went through with it it was it wasn't exactly the easiest I did it later than most I did it at about 22 I was second guessing to a degree not that I didn't f- know I wanted to do it, but I was like, do I, should I really do this? Mm-hmm. And I fucking went with it. I said, I don't care what anyone says. I don't care where I am. I need to do this. And after that experience, I came back home. I was safe and healthy. I said, okay, any other, I made a promise to myself. Anytime my gut is telling me something has to happen, run with I, it. It, I have to run with it. It needs to happen. And, and that's uh, from compounded experience. You know, that's how that builds. You it's know? amazing. And it only gets, it only gets, it really only gets better. Self-awareness so is, is an incredible fucking thing. You know, being aware of yourself and that drive and what's, you know, what direction you're getting pulled towards and running in one direction or another, you know, it's like people in your world too. It's like, I dealt with a lot of that, you know, even up until this minute, you know, some of my biggest moves I ever made, a lot of people in my world weren't in support of it. You know, a lot of people can't see it the way you see it and they can't feel it the way you feel it. But there's times in your life you just got to fucking go. And I had that. And a lot of people, I mean, to give you an idea, you know, I'll go back to this real quick. When I was, when I was real sick in the hospital, my mom never left my side in the hospital one day. She moved into the hospital with me and left with me when I was discharged. While I was real sick and we were going through the whole ordeal of like figuring out what the fuck was wrong with me, I was given the option to have surgery. And that's what really took me down that road. And we made the ultimate decision to have the surgery. It wasn't like the doctor came in and was like, you have to have the surgery. It was more of like a surgeon sat with me and he looked at me and he was like, Alex, you know, this is why I think you should elect to have this surgery. 
it'll change your entire future it will all be different for you if you go down this road now there came with huge risks it was a hip to hip surgery it was a two part surgery that means i had to have one surgery and then three months later have the same incision hip to hip again a second part of it my mom and dad were completely against having the surgery what were the what were the risks surviving <laughs> I mean, I was getting put to sleep for a six hour surgery. I mean, it was, there's endless, endless risks. So you could, um, you, you, you were risking your life to some degree? Everything, yeah. I mean, anytime anybody goes down for a surgery, you're, you're taking these kind of level risks. And, you know, the doctor looked at me and told me his feelings and my mom and dad were completely against it. They were not in with this idea. They were not down with going down that road. They wanted to keep experimenting as, you know, a lot of fearful parents would. And ultimately at 14 years old, I sat with the surgeon and I made that judgment call. And I convinced my mom to let us go down this road and let us have this surgery, let us and have this surgery and go down that path. And that was like one of my earlier years of going against, let's say like my support system, where usually you're a lot more comfortable to go down a road when your support system agrees with you versus doesn't. And at 14, being as fragile and young as I was, to look at my mom and she'll never forget this. And I was like, we're doing this. Like I'm having the surgery, like, like this is what I need to do as a 14 year old. I mean, thinking now that I have a son, I mean, it's batshit crazy, but that was like one of my earlier moments of going against the grain and going against, you know, the comfort system. The rest is history. You were also an only child. So for them, it's not as if, oh, well we have two others. So if something happens, they gave up everything for me. When I was sick, their attention, I mean, I don't know. It's like to keep in mind, like when you have a headache, you don't feel great. I mean, everything goes out the door. You, you don't have any kids, right? Yeah. No, no, no. Not um, no, I don't have any kids. Dogs, cats? I have a cat, actually. Okay, so your cat. You know, like when your cat's not feeling good, I, I feel this with my dog. My, when my dog's not feeling good, the whole world stops. Yeah, I, I hate it, yeah. So it's like, you know, my parents being as close to me as they were, when I got sick, their whole universe stopped. And they ran a business themselves. They were business owners. They were in the copy machine business, um, like in the early days of the copy machines. And they built their own copy machines. My parents gave up everything that they had going on in the world to hyper focus on me and my health. They gave up all of it for me. So, you know, going down that road with them and coming out of that road and the, the whole progression, it's just a compounded experience and it's special shit, you know? It's, dude, I, I was raised by a single grandmother. Mm-hmm. We'll go in, we'll, we'll get to know each other, obviously, and we'll go into it, but yeah, dude, I, I, I resonate with it. Yeah, it's it's wild, man. But when you have good parents, because I didn't have two parents. Understood. But she gave me, aside from the the financial aspect, she gave me all the attention I needed. She was always there. It's special. You need that. You really need that. Yeah. The world, uh, the world sets you up, you know, sometimes with with what you need. Whether it's one, two, six, seven, zero, you know, the world is a funny way of laying it out there for you, you know. And you were given what you were given for your reasons, you know. It's funny though because the world will do that and some people swat every opportunity away which is fucking ludicrous to me it's hard to, to it's hard to it's hard to see it in the moment sometimes because it doesn't appear outwardly it, it kind of comes in these in these kind of symbolic ways and you have to be able to decipher them mm-hmm. sometimes they're clear as day it's like oh that's fucking happening. something else i i live by and i i talk about and i preach a lot about is paying attention to signs you know, and again, it's not something I can like prove or like put onto paper, but like the reality is, is I swear the world gives you signs and the world, things happen and like, you got to pay attention. Sometimes there's clues. You got to follow the clues, you know, and in my life, I've constantly looked out for the clues. And as I realize that I'm looking out for the clues, I look out for them even more and then become more aware that like, the universe gives signs and clues and so things true. and like you make a decision in that moment whether you're paying attention to these kinds of things whether you're aware whether you want to be aware or whether you don't give a fuck and like you know you're just in another direction that's okay too right. you know sometimes it's easier you know it's like the funny word ignorance is bliss funny sentence ignorance is bliss it is funny and you know sometimes i joke with guys i work with or friends or family like Sometimes it'd be a lot easier not to pay attention to all these things and not to look for the clues and follow the clues. And again, this is, this is the beauty of life, right? You know, you can approach life and approach your world as deep, as shallow, as in and out as you want. I choose the deeper end of things, you know, but I, but I respect people that, you know, don't want to go as deep and don't want to listen. Everybody, people are really good at convincing themselves of shit. (laughs) I'm one of them. 
Um, so I choose to convince myself of this stuff um, and I enjoy it. And I, I find a lot of fulfillment out of that part of life for me mentally. I've never been an ignorance is bliss kind of person, but then there are times where but I'm But you like, know maybe. people that are. Oh, for sure. And you've probably heard the saying a million times and like a lot I of don't people believe, have. I, I don't, it's not that there isn't some level of truth to it. It's that I can't live my life that way. I need to seek things out. I need to know things. And sometimes it's to a detriment. Sometimes it's like, ah, I probably didn't need to know that. But well, it's like the saying, like the curious cat, you know, it like gets, gets a cat killed, like being so curious, but satisfaction brought it back part of life like listen you know part of life is exploring everything you know and that's like again i think some people when they have it taken away temporarily you know sometimes it makes you dive a little deeper and for me i think that's what happened to me when i was a kid i think that the pullback of everything i loved like for example i couldn't eat food for 30 days i think it was they wouldn't let me actually f eat oh, so food in my mouth tube no, no tube. They would give me all my nutrients of what I needed through IVs, a pick, like, through like a pick line, it's called, whatever. Um, but I couldn't actually eat or drink. And so mentally, I was starving. Wow. But physically, they were keeping me going. But like, let me fucking tell you, like, my appreciation for food was like, I mean, all Probably day long on do. TV, you, you on the know. movies, like, all you see are food commercials. And like, when you're in a hospital sick as a kid, like, all you do is watch movies. You know, I'd watch fucking 100 <coughs> movies a day. And food, 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 food. But it's just like it, you know, some things in my life have just narrowed into appreciation that took me down a road. And to this minute, I am so appreciative of every fucking meal, every drink of water, every drink. Because, like, I remember what it was like. So, like, I, I swear that, like, maybe I thought I had it too good. And, like, I, I don't, you know, I'll never know why, right? There's never a why. But I definitely, what's the word? I, I appreciate that challenge and I appreciate my current challenge and I think that there'll always be challenges forever but the idea is to what do you come out of these challenges with and I think that so far I've uh, exploited the challenges that I've that have come towards me and I'm going to continue to exploit them that's what it's all about man that's what that's what it, that's what's so beautiful about being a man and I don't I don't say that as it's not beautiful no no as, as a being woman a human being Right, but I look at it, I, I am going to say the man thing because I just, you know, not to get all men and women here, but I just, I think as our role, we have to continue to bulls, bulldoze through challenges, accept them, feel them, experience them, but, you know, push through them and allow them to shape us. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been another episode of Soothing Semantics. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. Don't be an asshole. Subscribe to my podcast. I hope it was soothing. Smash it. I think it was. If we finally got the mics working, homie. There you go. Yeah. Um, subscribe to the channel. Smash the like button. Leave your comments. Make sure to follow Alex Goldstein, a.k.a. the King of Golden Beach, on Instagram at Alex Goldstein. Uh, it's at Mr. Alex Goldstein. Mr. Alex oh, Goldstein. Sorry. Right. Okay. You'll find me. And uh, obviously follow me. Until next time. Thank you.